Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we will present a new subject on pediatric surgery made easy. Our subject today is gallbladder disease in infant and children. It's very important for all pediatric surgeon and pediatrician to be aware about gallbladder disease in children, how to diagnose and how to treat. It's very essential to be aware about the new classification, the new algorithm about this important disease. Let's start. Our objective today is to know, number one, what is good bladder disease in infant and the children? Number two, what about the gallstones? And what about biliary dyskinesia? And what is a calculus gallbladder disease and finally how to diagnose and how to manage this infant and children with this disease number one what is gallbladder disease gallbladder disease in children may be classified into number one disease due to the presence of the gallstone it's called gallbladder stone disease or called cholelysiasis. Number two, biliary dyskinesia. Biliary dyskinesia, we mean that the gallbladder not contracted efficiently. Number three, disease or pathology without the presence of the gallstone, called a calculus or a calcular gallbladder disease. Number one, gallstone disease. Cholelysiasis. Sciences. Cholelysiasis is a gallbladder or gallbladder disease due to the presence of gallstones. It's a well-known entity in adult, no doubt about this. However, in children, the diagnosis of this problem is increasingly in the few last decades. Maybe due to the widespread use of the ultrasound, maybe due to the epidemics of childhood obesity. So it's very essential to be aware about it. Number one, we will start to speak about the physiology of bile. Bile produced by the liver, concentrated in the gallbladder, bile composed of water and electrolyte, bile acids and bile salt, phospholipid, cholesterol, and bile pigment, which is a bilirubin. Bile is very important and very essential for emulsification of the fat and absorption of the fat, soluble vitamins. Number two, excretion of the bilirubin, which is the waste product of the distractions of the old RBCs. So the function is, number one, facilitate absorptions of the lipids and fat-soluble vitamins, Number two, excretion of the cholesterol. Cholesterol is a fat soluble to be excreted in the bile, which is a watery. It cannot be excreted without surrounded with bile salt and bile acids. So the bile salt and bile acids will surround the globule of the cholesterol, helping this cholesterol to pass through the biliary system and then to be absorbed in the small bowel. Excretion of the bilirubin. What's bilirubin? It is the waste or the destruction of the old RBCs. All of us know that the usual RBCs live for about 120 days and it will be destructed. And then the hemoglobin will be uh, divided into the heme and globin. Globin will pass into the circle for the amino acid and proteins and the globin will be passed into several steps to the burden and then unconjugated bilirubin and then the bilirubin will pass to the liver to become conjugated with the glucuronic acid to be excreted as a conjugated bilirubin water soluble in the biliary system then to the small bowel. There is an important thing called the molecular mechanism of bile formation. The biliary canalicular membrane 
contain four gates. These gates or cassette is very important for the transport of the phospholipid, pine salt, cholesterol, and bilirubin. It's called ABCB4 and ABCB11 and ABCG5, ABCG2. These gates is very essential for the passage of the phospholipid uh, bile acids and the cholesterol and pilerol. If one of these gates is not working or if there is a genetic disorder affecting one of the genes coding for this gate, the child may develop gallstones and in such case it will be termed genetic factors. So, if there are rule for genetic factors in the formation of the gallstones, yes. In children, it have a rule. There is maybe genetic defect. In these four gates or four cassettes, and in such cases, these children will have an increased risk for the formation of the gallstones, and we will discuss. As we see in this image, there is a gate called ABCB4 for the passage of the phospholipid. Number two, gate called ABCB11 for the passage of the bile acid. And there is a gate called ABCG5 and ABCG8 for the passage of the cholesterol. What happened? At first, bile acid is passed from its gate forming what's called symbol micelle. This symbol micelle is with a green color in the picture. Symbol micelles of the bile acid. This presence of the bile acid will stimulate the other two gates to pass the phospholipid and the calcium. And then you will see the picture that this phospholipid and the bile acid will surround the cholesterol micelle, forming what's called mixed micelle. So this can pass through the extra hepatic bile cystinary ducts and into the small bowel. Without these bile acids and phospholipid cholesterol will precipitate and it will not be soluble in the bile. So it's very essential for these gates to work well and the genetic link to be okay for this process to happen to allow the passage of the cholesterol in the biliary system and then in the small bowel surrounded by the bile acid and the bile salt forming what's called mixed micelle. Bile acid form the simple micelle within the biliary lumen and activate the two other gates to secrete the phospholipid and the cholesterol to allow this substance to pass through it and then cholesterol is only soluble, only soluble in the aqueous bile. Uh, so therefore, it forms a mixed micelle with the bile salt and the phospholipid, thus enabling the secretion of the cholesterol into the intestine. After that, the bile acid, after doing its role and passing to the small bowel and the colon, it will be reabsorbed back to the liver. And this is called enterohepatic recirculation or enterohepatic circulation. So the process starts with the presence of the cholesterol. From the cholesterol, the liver will form bile acids. These bile acids will pass through the canalicular membrane and after that it will stimulate the other two gates for the passage of the phospholipid and the passage of the cholesterol. The bile acid itself is called symbol micelle. This symbol micelle will surround by the phospholipid and surround the cholesterol to form the mixed micelle. This can pass into the small bowel and thus cholesterol will not precipitate. If there is, if there is any error in these gates due to genetic factor, cholesterol will precipitate. If there is very high dietary cholesterol, overproduction of the cholesterol, also cholesterol will precipitate because it exceeds the capacity of solubility provided by the bile salt and the bile acids. If there is disease affecting the reabsorption of the bile salt and the bile acids from the terminal ileum, 
the anterior hepatic circulation, cholesterol concentration will increase and will precipitate. So again, the acid transporter essential for the secretion of the phospholipid, bile acid, and the cholesterol into the biliary lumen. Step one, the simple micelle of the bile acid activate the phospholipid and cholesterol gate to open. Then the phospholipid, bile acid, and the cholesterol form protective mixed micelle that can be soluble in the bile and it can be passed to the small bowel and absorb it. What are the risk factors for the development of cholelysiasis? What are the risk factors for the development of the gallstones in children? Gallstones in children can be attributed to whether, number one, hemolytic disorder. What meaning by hemolytic disorder? We mean that there is increased destruction of the RBCs or increased hemolysis. This increased hemolysis will lead to excess unconjugated bilirubin that may exceed the capacity of the conjugation of the liver. And this unconjugated bilirubin will combine with the calcium and forming calcium bilirubinate precipitate in the bile, leading to gallstone. Number two, non-hemolytic disorder, children without hemolysis, but have other causes or risk factors. We will discuss it soon. Number three, no identifiable risk factors. It's sometimes called idiopathic and reported in the literature from 23 to 52%, which is not a small percent. Hemolytic cholelysis, we mean that a child with a hereditary hemolytic disorders, like what's called sickle cell disease, thalassemia, and hereditary spherocytosis, all will lead to increased RPCs hemolysis. This hemolysis will lead to production of the large amount of unconjugated bilirubin. In the normal way, this unconjugated bilirubin will be conjugated in the liver. However, if the production is very high, it will exceed the capacity of the liver to conjugate this unconjugated bilirubin with glucuronic acid. In such case, the unconjugated bilirubin will present in the bile as it, and then it will combine with calcium, forming calcium bilirubinate and precipitate as a gallstone. It's called plaque gallstone due to presence of the pigment of the bilirubin. This table illustrates the main three hemolytic disorders seen in children. Sickle cell disease, thalassemia, and spherocytosis. Sickle cells, the incidence of the cholelysis in a sickle cells is about 50% of the children. Incidence increase with age and about 30 of the children having cholelysis by the age of 10 years and almost 50% of the sickle cell disease patients found to have cholelysis are asymptomatic, no present with symptoms. Sickle cell related to the shape of the RBCs, usually RBCs is biconcave. In such disease, during hypoxia, if the oxygen is decreased, these RBCs will become more spherical, more rigid, and it will not pass and will be distracted by the phagocytic systems in the spleen, and it will lead to increased hemolysis. Thalassemia, also a common hemolytic disorder associated with gallstone or cholelysis, uh, increased of cholelysis sufficiently decreased due to the use of the hypertransfusion that decreases the production of the fragile red cells. Also, spherocytosis, RBCs here, is a rigid sphere. Overall incidence of the gallstones range from the 43 to 63, however, it is uncommon before the 10 years of age. So this is the first risk factors and very important in children and should be excluded in any child with hemolytic, in any child with gallstones. You should exclude the hemolytic causes. Number two, non-hemolytic cholelysis. Non-hemolytic gallstones, why? Maybe due to genetic factors, maybe due to prolonged use of the total parenteral nutrition, maybe due to very common therapy with 
ceftriaxone, cell generation, cephalosporin, maybe due to lack of the enteral feeding, pile stasis, maybe due to ileal resection, maybe due to anomalies in the biliary system or the gallbladder. In adolescent, the causes may be related to a childhood or adolescent obesity, pregnancy, and oral contraceptive. We will speak about the genetic factors. Is there a role for the genetic factors in a gallstone formation in infant and in children? Yes. Various lysogenic genes have been identified to cause gallstone formation. The most important is caused by the mutation of the gene 4, ABCB4, responsible for the transport of the phospholipid across the biliary canalicular membrane. As we said, Thus, these three gates or three cassettes is very important for surrounding the cholesterol, for preventing the cholesterol from being precipitated. So there is maybe mutation for the gene responsible for this process. So this infant or neonates may present with gallstone recurrent, recurrence or persistent gallstones. This ABCB4 gene mutation may present in the neonates as what is called progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. Progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis in the neonatal period and the presentation may range from biliary sludge or just biliary mud or intrahepatic and extrahepatic cholestasis or sometimes in the stage liver failure requiring transplantation. So very essential to understand this genetic problem in infant and neonate with gallstones. The ABCCB4 mutation reported up to 30% of the adult patient. Yes, in adult patient with unexplained recurrent cholestasis, cholesterol gallstone or biliary sludge or biliary mud and termed low phospholipid associated cholelysis. Low phospholipid because the gate or the cassette for the phospholipid is closed. So in such cases, there is a low phospholipid. As there is low bile salt, low bile acids, there is increased cholesterol and there will be cholestasis. Pediatric study also reported uh, on uh, about uh, 19 patients with a cholesterol gallstone, found one patient had ABCB4 mutation, which may contribute to the presence or the formation of gallstones. Obesity. Nowadays, there is an increased epidemic of obesity. Obesity is a well known risk for the gallstone, both in adults and in children. There is in obesity, there is will be a hyper secretion of the cholesterol, overproduction of the cholesterol, so the bile will become super saturated with cholesterol. It will exceed the capacity for the bile acid and the bile salt to surround the cholesterol molecule, and the cholesterol will precipitate. Number two, in obesity, there is will be gallbladder dysmotility. The contraction, evacuation of the gallbladder will be incomplete or immature. Number three, in the obese children, there is will be insulin resistance, which also stimulate cholesterol overproductions and inhibit some enzymatic process inside the liver. TBN associated cholelysis. TBN associated gallstones reported as a risk factors due to pile stasis and gallstones in children. However, there is no statistically significant association between the duration of the TBN and the development of gallstones. It reported after few days in some infant and it reported after few months in other. However, the present association in the literature is related to number one, multiple abdominal operations. Number two, loss of the eucecal valve. So ileocecal valve is very essential for the pediatric surgeon. Please don't remove the ileocecal valve, except if indicated, because this baby will develop gallstone. Why? Due to impaired reabsorption of the bile acids and bile salt. 
The liver form a bile acid, new, yes. However, about 95 of the secreted bile acid and bile salt will be reabsorbed to the liver, and the liver will form only about 5%. So if you remove the terminal ileum, remove the ileocecal valve, this bile salt pool will be decreased, so the cholesterol will increase, and the bile becomes super saturated with cholesterol, which will precipitate as a sediment or stones in the gallbladder. Number three, short power syndrome, yes. So there is what's called TBN associated cholelysis. So we may have an one arm for the hemolytic. Hemolysis increase production of the unconjugated bilirubin in the bile, will combine with calcium forming calcium bilirubinate. And we may have second arm, non-hemolytic. What? Yes. Maybe bile stasis, whole bladder anomalies, TBN, genetic factors, obesity, uh, all these items, so resection of the terminal ileum, Crohn's disease, necrotizing enterocolitis, colitis, diseases affecting the small bowel, decreasing the re enterohepatic recirculation, and lead to supersaturated bile with precipitation. The question now is how to classify the gallstone in a children? There is maybe cholesterol stone, maybe pigment stone, maybe calcium carbonate, and finally it may be what's called microlease and inspissated bile syndrome. The ratio is different from adult. In adult, the cholesterol taking the upper hand of the percentage. However, in children, the percentage may be different. To summarize, the difference between the cholesterol, pigment, and calcium, you can see the following table. In the cholesterol, there is excess cholesterol with a high dietary intake, or there is high secretion of the bile salt and bile acid and phospholipid, so we will lead to what's called supersaturated bile. Cholesterol saturation index, or what's called CSI, it's a ratio between the biliary cholesterol concentration and the maximal cholesterol concentration that would be soluble in the bile. If it uh, above one or more than one, the crystal of the cholesterol will start to precipitate, ranging from the microlease intra and extra hepatic gallstone. On the middle column, there is will be the pigment stones. Pigment may be plaque pigment related to the hemolytic disorders we said. Sickle cell thalassemia, hereditary spherocytosis, or after ileal resection in the Crohn's or necrotizing enterocolitis due to reduction in the bile salt pool. Or maybe brown. Brown pigment, it's quite rare in children related to the presence of the bacterial biliary tract infection and associated with biliary tract dilatation and dystasis. They can be found in the CBD years after cholecystectomy. So stones years after cholecystectomy may be related to the brown pigment infection, dilatation, bacterial infection. And the third type is called calcium carbonate. About 20% of the pediatric gallstones, in, especially in boys, can be from these types. Some ulcers link uh, intermittent cystic duct obstruction and increased mucin production as a result this may result in calcium carbonate uh, precipitate. So this is the three types. Cholesterol, pigment stone, calcium carbonate stone. After that, the force is the microlysis and inhibited bile syndrome. What is microlys? Micro, we know the stone. What's micro? Micro is a gallstone less than 3 mm in size, may be seen intra or extra hepatic. It may explain the persistent symptoms of the biliary colic, cholecystitis or pancreatitis following cholecystectomy. You perform cholecystectomy, however, the child is still complaining of biliary colic. Due to their small size, the diagnosis will not be easy job with ultrasound. You may need to perform endoscopic ultrasound, ERCB, or sometimes nasopiliary aspiration for the diagnosis. What is 
in a specific pile or a sludge or biliary mud. It's precipitate of the cholesterol crystal, calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, calcium bilirubinate, calcium salt, which will be embedded in the biliary mucin and form some sort of mud or sludge inside the gallbladder. The common predisposing factors for this condition, mud, biliary mud, is a systemic infection. If the child or the neonate or the infant have a systemic infection, children or infant on TBM, rapid weight loss or prolonged fasting, poor gallbladder uh, contractility or biliary stasis, and also the use of the third generation cephalosporin, ceftriaxone. These conditions may lead to the formation of the biliary mud. So, regarding the risk factors, well, maybe hemolysis or maybe non-hemolysis or idiopathic. Regarding the type of the stone, may, we may have a cholesterol pigment, black and brown, calcium carbonate, microlysiasis, and in speciated bile syndrome may be related to the small gallstone is in three millimeter and we may have biliary mud. What about the clinical presentation of cholelysiasis? The clinical presentation of the gallstones may be asymptomatic gallstones. We mean that it incidentally diagnosed during performing ultrasound. We may have symptomatic, uncomplicated gallstones, just pain, biliary colic, nausea, vomiting. However, there is no fever, no jaundice, uncomplicated, or maybe complicated gallstones present at the first presentation, maybe with a complicated one, acute cholecystitis, cholidocolysis, or maybe pancreatitis as a first presentation. Symptomatic gallstones. The classic presentation will be the right upper quadrant pain, biliary colic, sharp, crampy pain, radiate to the right shoulder and scapula after a fatty meal and lasting for several hours. This is a classic description. However, in younger children, this pain may not present. Younger children may present with nausea, vomiting, and may not show the classic abdominal pain. During physical examination, it may be unremarkable during the episodes of the pain in uncomplicated cases. Maybe right upper quadrant abdominal tenderness may be present. In a complicated cases, the complication may be the first presentation for acute cholecystitis, cholidoku, lysitis, and the cholangitis, biliary pancreatitis. And this table also for summarize. Acute cholecystitis. The cystic duct will be obstructed by a stone with a gallbladder distension and inflammation and maybe secondary bacterial infection. There is a severe and persistent pain, unlike the biliary colic, which lasts for a few hours. Here, there is a severe and persistent pain. There is a fever, unlike the uncomplicated cases. On examination, there is will be right upper quadrant tenderness and will be Murphy sign. What's Murphy sign? inspiratory arrest with deep palpation of the right subcostal region. So this indicating acute cholecystitis, acute inflammation of the gallbladder due to obstruction of the cystic duct. Number two, the CBD stone. CBD stone, colodocolysiasis. Uncommon in children, maybe primary stone in the biliary duct or maybe coming stone or secondary from the gallbladder. The pain like the biliary colic, maybe nausea and vomiting also on physical examination, mild right upper quadrant or epigastric tenderness, maybe scleral ectras, maybe jaundice if the stone is impacted and obstructing the biliary tree. The third one is called cholangitis, inflammation of the biliary tract, ascending bacterial infection of the biliary tree, secondary to the CBD stone, cholangitis. And this characterized by what's called Charcot triad, fever, right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. And if the case is neglected, the baby or the child may pass to renal pentad, confusion, septicemia. However, it's common in elderly than in children. The biliary pancreatitis, we mean that 
the stone is either obstructing the pancreatic duct or just passing through or in front of the pancreatic duct will lead to pancreatitis. However, it's less common to be associated with fever or jaundice. So this presentation of the complicated gallstones may be the first presentation for children. The very important question, how to diagnose gallstones? The diagnostic interventions for the gallstones or cholelysis should be performed to identify the stone and to determine the underlying cause. So you have two jobs. Number one, detect the presence of the gallstone. Number two, asking about the etiology. What's the risk factor for these gallstones? Is it Cholesterol from obesity, is it hemolysis from hemolysis, is it genetic disorder, TBN, gallbladder stasis in this baby, undergoing resection of the small bowel or the terminal area. So we may use history and physical examination, laboratory investigation and the imaging studies. Number one, history and physical examination, as you see. Evaluation should include history of the hemolytic disease in the child or the family. Recurrent ectras or jaundice in the child or the family, splenomegaly in the relative or the child with anemia, use of the sift triag zone, and maybe chronic liver disease in the child or family mortality due to liver disorder called Wilson disease. Wilson disease from high copper precipitations in the liver and ending with liver failure, or maybe. Chronic diarrhea, steatorrhea, and weight loss, severe skin itching, Baylor's disease, Baylor disease, the liver cannot secrete the bile, and the bile will be, there is, will be intrahepatic cholestasis. So you should ask about these items when you taking a history. The laboratory investigation, you should perform complete blood count, liver function, and hemolytic profile to exclude hemolytic disorders, osmotic fragility, and hemoglobin electrophoresis. Also, you should search for amylase, lipase, and copper if you suspect presence of acute pancreatitis or chronic liver disease. The sweet test may be needed for the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is the one of the causes for the presence or formation of the gallstone. It's one of the risk factors. Imaging studies, also abdominal ultrasound, this is imaging of a choice by all pediatric surgeons and should be the first one to be performed. It will document the presence or the absence of the gallstone. Also, the size of the stone will be measured. It will document the gallbladder wall thickness, the presence of the pericholecystic fluid collection or present inflammation. Also, the state of the liver and the pancreas can be evaluated with ultrasound, the sensitivity and specificity over 90 in adult, however, in children, it may be lower a little, it may be as 82%. Number two, HIDA scan. HIDA scan in children that don't have a gallstone or ultrasound, but have the symptoms suggestive of the biliary disease. So in, by this investigation, we will evaluate the gallbladder contraction. What about the contractility? Is there is a, some sort of dysmotility of the gallbladder? So assess the cystic duct patency and the gallbladder contractility. If there is none visualized gallbladder with filling of the common bile and the duodenum, the indicates cystic duct obstruction, acute cholecystitis. If there is normal filling of the gallbladder, we can perform the cholecystokinin analog infusion like the cholecystokinin produced in the human body. This will stimulate the gallbladder to contract. So we can calculate what's called gallbladder ejection fraction, like, like that of the heart. Gallbladder ejection fraction, if it is less than 35, the case diagnosed as a biliary dyskinesia. So this HIDA scan is indicated for children that don't have a gallstone on ultrasound, but have symptoms suggestive of the biliary disease, biliary colic and nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. So there is no gallstones. What happened? We can perform HIDA scan to assess the patency of the cystic duct, the contractility, to diagnose two conditions, acute cholecystitis, biliary dyskinesia. 
The third one is MRCB. MRCB, this is for the complicated bladder disease. It's non-invasive with no radiation. However, it requires, sometimes require anesthesia, especially in the younger the children. It's sensitivity reaching about 95, a specificity reaching about 89 in the detecting the CBD stones. So, we will speak about the second one is biliary kinesia. We said at the start of the presentation that gallbladder disease in children may be one of three. It may be gallstone, cholelysis. It may be biliary dyskinesia. The gallbladder don't contract efficiently. It may be a calculus problem. Gallbladder disease without gallstone. So here we will speak about the biliary dyskinesia. It defined as poor gallbladder contractility. With gallbladder ejection fraction, as we said, less than 35. The patient manifests clinically with biliary colic symptoms, but with no evidence of the gallstones on ultrasound. It's the same presentation like gallstones, but without gallstones. Maybe due to or explained by the lack of coordination between the contraction of the gallbladder and relaxation of the sphincter of oddity. So this may explain the biliary dyskinesia. The diagnosis, it will be diagnosed with HIDA scan, with cholecystokinin infusion, to calculate the gallbladder contractility and to assess if there is low ejection fraction or contractility, less than 35% is diagnostic. However, it's very important prior to perform any surgery or any treatment to discuss this problem with the, child, with the family of the child because sometimes child symptoms not completely relieved after you remove the cold bladder. We will speak about the treatment. The treatment for this condition, the ideal one is unclear. Some children improve after laparoscopic cholecystectomy. However, others don't improve. So laparoscopic cholecystectomy result in the symptom resolution in about 80% uh, of the cases, however, up to 40% with a gallbladder ejection fraction less than 35 don't experience relief of symptoms. On the other hand, patients with gallbladder ejection fraction less than 15 are most likely to uh, achieve relief or resolution of symptoms. So this is a dilemma or debate about the biliary dyskinesia and its ideal treatment. To remove the gallbladder, you should inform the family of the child that removal of the gallbladder may not result in resolution. The child may improve or may not improve. The result in the literatures and all papers are not uniform. Now we will speak about the third one, which is a calculus or a calcular gallbladder disease. Gallbladder disease without gallstones. Gallbladder disease without gallstones may be related to what's called gallbladder hydrops, a calculus cholecystitis, gallbladder polyp. The increasing incidence of some of these diagnoses believed to be secondary to the increased number of critically ill children. So it's very important for the pediatric surgeon to be aware of these acalculus problems as a cause for the gallbladder disease in children. Number one. Gallbladder hydrops. What's the meaning of hydrops? Acute gallbladder distension, edema without gallstones. Infections or congenital anomalies. Severe sepsis may explain this disease, may explain the occurrence of hydrops of the gallbladder. Acute severe distension in the gallbladder may be explained by transient obstruction of the cystic duct. And usually, most cases treated conservatively, antibiotics, analgesic, IV fluids. However, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is indicated if the symptom is progressing or if the ultrasound shows that there is evidence of gangrenous gallbladder on ultrasound or there is increasing distension. So, these two indications we may need to use laparoscopic cholecystectomy. This is the first one of what of a calculus gallbladder disorder. The second one is called a calculus cholecystitis. 
we speak so on uh, uh, for calcular cholecystites, goliston obstructing the cystic duct. However, here there is cholecystitis, acute inflammation of the gallbladder without stone, seen in the critically ill patient with severe sepsis or shock, burn, trauma, prolonged total parenteral nutrition, the bile stasis and the gallbladder distension, ischemia, possibly bacterial colonization, and the ultrasound will be diagnostic. And in high scale, in unclear cases, there is well being non visualized gallbladder. And also, it treated with startment of the treatment will start with IV fluids, antibiotics, laparoscopic cholecystectomy will be based on the patient condition. If the patient is stable, it's okay. Some cases in unstable patient, we may need to insert a tube for drainage of the distended gallbladder called the cholecystostomy tube in unstable child. The third one is polyp in the gallbladder. It's rare in the children. However, the use of widespread use of ultrasound lead to increasing diagnosis of this condition. The long-term follow-up of these children in the literature is not available. However, uh, it's advisable to perform laparoscopic cholecystectomy for the polyp that is symptomatic or the polyp more than one centimeter in size. Now, we will speak about the important corner of the gallbladder disease, which is the gallstone disease. So gallbladder disease include gallstone, cholelysis, and number two, biliary dyskinesia, motility disorder of the gallbladder, number three, a calculus, gallbladder disease. The first one is a gallstone or cholelysis, gallstone, yes, Circulation of the bile may be affected, leading to overconcentration of the bile, oversaturation with cholesterol. Maybe hemolysis, unconjugated bilirubin, conjugated with the calcium. There is maybe non-hemolytic, maybe genetic rule, maybe TPN, maybe biliary stasis, resection of the small bowel, biliary disease, obesity, TPN. And there is maybe idiopathic causes for the gallstones. The question is, how to treat gallstone? In adult, the treatment is well established and there is a guidelines for treatment. However, the problem is in children and infant neonates. The treatment in the literature is heterogeneous and based on a small population studies. And the evidence-based studies are either lacking, outdated, or represent certain opinion of pediatric surgeon working in a certain hospital or central location. In the literature, there is maybe Sweden, Brazil, India, USA, Egypt, Iran. So there is no well-documented consensus exists. How to treat a gallstones in a child or how to treat a gallstones in neonate or infant. We will go deeply in the subject. The treatment of cholelysis depend on number one, age of the child or the neonate. Number two, presence or absence of the symptomatology. Whether the child is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Number three, the type of the gallstone, cholesterol, pigment stone, maybe calcium carbonate, maybe microlease, or maybe biliary mount. Number four, underlying cause of the stone formation. Is your case due to hemolysis, hemolytic anemia, or hemolytic disorder? Is your case from obesity? Is your case from biliary stasis? Is your case from rapid weight loss? Is your case from resection of the terminal ileum or short bowel syndrome? So these four items will determine the pathway of the treatment. We will start with neonates and the infant. How to treat gallstones in the neonates and the infant? Treatment, provided there is no complication, is number one, conservative therapy. Recommended in this very small infant and the neonate with a regular follow up because more than half of the neonates and the infant with gallstone experience spontaneous resolution of the gallstone or remain asymptomatic. Cholecystectomy indicated, yes, but only in infants who develop biliary symptom or infectious complication. 
So generally speaking, the incidence of the neonatal gallstones is less than 0.5% and maybe without any risk factors or maybe related cholestasis and genetic problem. So the treatment will be two options. Conservative, this is the rule because more than half will experience spontaneous resolution of the gallstones and maybe cholecystectomy indicated in infant who develop the biliary colic or infectious complication. There is a retrospective review published in the literature of 13 gallstone patients showing that only two infants required cholecystectomy. The authors reported that of the remaining 11 infants, one only had gall, a CBD stone that resolved spontaneously. Yes and 10 patients remain asymptomatic. Five of these asymptomatic experience resolution of their gallstone with a mean follow-up of 1.8 years. So this retrospective review support the conservative serum. The published papers regarding the neonatal gallstones and infant gallstones is very small in the literature and maybe case series only. So there is no longer flow up, no large number of infants. Cholelysis in older children, not neonates. The treatment should be divided into three groups. Asymptomatic gallstones, no symptoms. You detect the stone incidentally on doing ultrasound. What you will do? You will remove the gallbladder? You will leave the stone? Or what you do? Very important question. Number two, symptomatic but uncomplicated. There is just biliary colic, just nausea and vomiting, upper abdominal pain related to the fatty meals, but no fever or jaundice. Or may you face complicated gallstones. So these three scenarios, you may be faced the pediatric surgeon. Number one, how to treat asymptomatic gallstone. Asymptomatic, we mean that the gallstone diagnosed incidentally during the ultrasound. Surprisingly, up till now, no well-established treatment consoles exist. And the recommended treatment in the literature is, number one, treatment as peritiology. If this asymptomatic is due to hemolysis or due to PPM or due to opacity or this may be due to resection of the small bowel, so you will determine first the etiology. You may need to perform regular clinical and ultrasound follow-up Trial of oral therapy or dissolution therapy. There is what's called yorsu deoxycholic acid. It is given to dissolve the cholesterol stone. Some sort of the bile acids or bile salt will be given to increase the solubility of the cholesterol stone in case that this stone is cholesterol, not pigment stone. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy to remove the gallbladder no well-established consoles for indication. So, how to treat asymptomatic gallstone in children? No well-established consoles exist up till now. There is maybe treatment as per etiology, regular clinical follow-up, trial of dissolution therapy to dissolve the stone. But experience in children is very small, with high recurrence rate, about 60% and only for the cholesterol stone. Also, this uroxid, also the oxycholic acid side effects, diarrhea and liver dysfunction. So it's not recommended for the treatment in children. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy. To perform laparoscopic cholecystectomy in children with asymptomatic stone, no biliary symptoms. Let's see. Is cholecystectomy indicated for asymptomatic pediatric patient? Question. Very important question. There is a three schools or three opinions for the pediatric surgeon. The first school, some pediatric surgeon believe that laparoscopic cholecystectomy in asymptomatic children is indicated only in children with associated comorbidities like hemolytic anemia. So the first school will perform laparoscopic cholecystectomy and remove gallbladder only in case this child investigated and proved to have 
hemolytic disorder. So this first BD group of pediatric surgeon will remove the gallbladder in such case. Second group of pediatric surgeon believe that the laparoscopic cholecystectomy is indicated in all asymptomatic patients. Why? Their argument is, number one, there is incidence of the high complication reported from these stones and the complication, acute cholecystitis, CPD stones, cholangitis, pancreatitis, may be the first presentation. So please remove the stone before complication happens. Number two, they consider that the operative time, the morbidity, the post-operative stay will be less and the morbidity less and the operative time will be less. When you perform the surgery on a symptomatic child, when compared to this surgery on symptomatic. So they recommend removal of the gallbladder in asymptomatic children. Number three, they consider the gallstones as a risk factor for the gallbladder cancer, especially if large stone, more than two centimeters. They suppose that the child will live for a long time, maybe 60, maybe 70 years later. With this presence of the gallstones, it will irritate the gallbladder wall, may form a cancer in the gallbladder. So please remove the gallbladder. Number four, they consider the psychological consequence for the child and family when they know that their child have a gallstone and need a surgery have a surgical problem, they will be very distressed. So this is the second school. Remove the gallbladder, laparoscopic cholecystectomy in asymptomatic children. With this argument for these options, high incidence of complication reported in the literature may reach 50% complication, operative time and morbidity post-operative stays is less when you perform the surgery on asymptomatic patient on elective basis. Number three, the gallstones is a risk for cancer. Number four, they consider the psychological consequences. So the first school perform only, lab coli only, if there is underlying comorbidities at the hemolytic. The second will open the door. Open the door for lab cholecystectomy in all cases. The third group of surgeons believe that laparoscopic cholecystectomy is not indicated in the asymptomatic children. And they are going this, this as you should consider the morbidity of unnecessary cholecystectomy performed in asymptomatic child. You will perform unneeded surgery. You will perform surgery unnecessary on asymptomatic. The child have no symptoms at all. Number two, they said that the long-term course of these children with asymptomatic stone is not well known up till now. And unlike adult, adult patients with silent gallstones, some papers show that no long-term risk of symptoms or adverse event leading to cholecystectomy. So this is cool not recommend performing laparoscopic cholecystectomy, arguing that because you will perform unnecessary cholecystectomy in asymptomatic patient. Why? Number two, they consider that the long-term course of a children with asymptomatic gallstone is not well known. So they documented with, uh, there is published in the literature, large Canadian study of about 300 82 children with a gallstone, half of them were asymptomatic. Show with that. This study reported that large proportion of the asymptomatic patient will never cause problem. Number two, in fact, they reported about 16% completely resolved in children and about 34 resolved in infant. Number two, this paper document also that the rate of the complication in asymptomatic gallstones was low, less than 5%, suggesting that the conservative management has an option for most of this infant. So there are three schools for the indication of laparoscopic cholecystectomy in asymptomatic child with gallstone. Number two, how to treat symptomatic gallstone. Symptomatic gallstone, baby present with recurrent upper quadrant pain, maybe nausea, vomiting, 
maybe fatty dyspepsia. How to treat? They recommend the treatment is an elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy to prevent the complication. It seems logic. So the recommended treatment in the literature is to remove the gallbladder on an elective basis. You prepare your child, investigate for the exclusion of the complications, prepare what you need, and then remove the gallbladder. But the condition will not pass easily. There will be an exception for this rule. The exception may be symptomatic infant under three years of age. The treatment of this very young infant should be individualized. You should individualize case by case. Number two, infant on prolonged TBM. Because of the spontaneous resolution of the gallstones, so observation in the absence of the complication, you should observe, or it's reasonable to observe this infant for about six to 12 months following the stoppage of the TBN and initiation of the enteral feeding. Number three, some pediatric surgeon add the infant with non-hemolytic and non-calcified stone without comorbidity. Non-hemolytic and non-calcified because they hope that it may be dissolved. And sometimes some pediatric surgeon use the dissolution therapy. We discussed for the asymptomatic group, use the azorso deoxycholic acid to dissolve this stone if these stones are calcium. Finally, we may have a special treatment consideration. So the treatment will pass into neonates and the infant, older children, older children three, symptomatic and asymptomatic. Special treatment consideration. Hemolytic cholelysis and TBM associated cholelysis in speciated bile or biliary mud. Known or suspected cholelysis, CBD stone. How to manage this infant in a specific manner or specific way? Number one, hemolysis. Sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease, baby or child is at high risk for post-operative complication. We said that Decreased oxygenation or stress will induce sickling, will induce destruction of the RBCs. So this baby may be vulnerable to postoperatively acute vasoocclusive pain crisis, acute chest syndrome, seizure, up to 20%. Number two, in these children there will be difficulty of finding compatible blood because of multiple blood transfusion and alloimmunization. So it's very difficult to find compatible blood. Number three, this baby may be immunocompromised. So these three major problems in sickle cell patient with gallstone. So what to do? The most important principle for improved operative outcome is adequate hydration and raising the hemoglobin level of these children before surgery to acceptable one, like 10 or 11. And recent review showed that the elective cholecystectomy in sickle cell decreases the morbidity when compared with emergent surgery, maybe due to optimization of the patient condition. So sickle cell disease needs special attention from the pediatric surgeon and pediatrician to prepare the baby before surgery to avoid complication postoperative. In case of gallstone, you plan to remove the gallbladder. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the sickle cell disease child is indicated for number one, symptomatic patient or symptomatic cholelysis. Number two, when symptomatology cannot be differentiated from sickle cell crisis. You don't know if this attack is this crisis, destruction of the RBCs, or from the gallbladder problem. Number three, in asymptomatic patient, you should take this with caution who are undergoing abdominal operation for other reason, performing a second surgery, splenectomy, performing any other operations. However, due to significant risk for the post-operative complication, this issue remains controversial. Remove the gallbladder or not during, even when you perform other surgery. Second one is hereditary spherocytosis, RBCs is spherical, unlike the biconcave, usual biconcave. Rigid, it will be distracted. Symptomatic child should undergo laparoscopic cholecystectomy, child for splenectomy. Usually, these children referred to the pediatric surgeon for splenectomy. In case you have a child 
with the hereditary spherocytosis refer to you to remove the spleen splenectomy. You should search by ultrasound for the presence of the gold bladder stone. If the gold bladder stone is present, you will remove the gold bladder as it will be straightforward surgery to remove the spleen and pick up the gold bladder. However, is there a rule for the prophylactic gold bladder removal? No stone in the gold bladder and you will perform splenectomy. You need to remove the gallbladder or not. Actually, the prophylactic gallbladder removal is not recommended in the literature. In a study of uh, 17 patients with spherocytosis, but not gallstones, we said if you have gallstone, you should remove the gallbladder. Not gallstones, and these authors follow these uh, children. None of the children developed cholelysis with a mean follow-up of about 15 years. So. Very important. Child referred for you with a hereditary spherocytosis for splenectomy, evaluate the gallbladder with ultrasound. If stone is present and documented, it is straightforward surgery to remove the gallbladder. However, if there is no stone, you don't recommend it. It's not recommended to perform prophylactic gallbladder removal. Leave the gallbladder as there is no stone. Thalassemia also is a major or a common hemolytic disorder associated with the gallstones. The incidence of the uh, gallstones in thalassemic patients significantly decreased, as we said, due to the use of the hypertransfusion regimen to decrease the production of the fragile red blood cell. This is the first special issue of the treatment, which is hemolytic cholelysis. Number two, treatment of the TBN-associated cholelysis. We said at the start that the TBN will lead to biliary stasis, will decrease the uh, hepatic circulation and also the additions of the amino acids in the TBN. All of this will lead to supersaturated bile, will lead to biliary stasis, decrease the gallbladder contraction and will lead to stone. How to treat? Usually, discontinuation or stoppage of the TBN regimen and start of the oral diet lead to establishment of the bile flow and resolve the bile sedimentation. This is the usual way. However, cholecystectomy may be considered in some cases where the TBN need to be continued for a long time, as enteral feeding cannot be started, as intestinal pseudo obstruction or short bowel syndrome. So in such case, you will need to perform therapeutic cholecystectomy. You need to perform therapeutic cholecystectomy and remove the gallbladder. So usual history or usual fate is resolution. With restoration of the oral feeding, there will be restoration of the biliary circulation and removal of this sedimentation or stones. However, in some cases, with prolonged TBN and the oral feeding is not uh, accept, uh, accessible, uh, there is some case of insignia pseudo obstruction short power, you should perform therapeutic cholecystic. How to treat inespecated bile or biliary mud or biliary sludge? We say that this is a precipitation occurring in some children with systemic infections with biliary stasis, and there will be precipitations, not stone, just mud uh, or, or sludge. It's usually the treatment, usually conservative, and it will improve. However, in rare cases of the recurrent symptoms or persistent obstruction with duct dilatation, may be trial with your sodioxycholic acid to dissolve this mud or ERCP and sphenectrotomy to relieve the obstruction if there is an obstruction. Occasionally in the unit, small unit, where the ERCP is not practical, the uh, percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram may be used to flush the intrahepatic and extrahepatic biliary system. It's very important procedure. So this is the treatment of what's called in speciated bile or biliary sludge or biliary mud. The treatment of known or suspected CBD stone, cholidocholysis, how to treat if you know or suspect, what to do. In adult, the situation is commonly handled by the ERCB. It's an easy job with sphenectrotomy, stone extraction, either before or after lab cholecystectomy. It's no problem. However, the problem in children, because the ERCB training team is not available in all centers. And also it's major problem in young patient on the infant in units that may require sometimes the help of the gastroenterologist for the adult to help this pediatric team. So the situation is different. 
between common bile duct stone in adult suspected or known and between child in adult ERCB will solve the problem basket removal or sphincterotomy or removal of the stone it's an easy however in children the ERCB training team is not available in all hospitals also due to small size and the pediatric surgeon may need help from the gastroenterologist for adult may need to perform committee so uh, there is an approach for managing the children with suspected uh, cholidocholysiasis to perform the ERCB. Yes, uh, if the ERCB and spinectomy are successful, it's okay. Pediatric surgeon can proceed with lab coli soon thereafter. However, if the ERCB and spinectomy are not successful, the pediatric surgeon will know that uh, he or uh, his uh, or her need uh, lab coli. That the co that cholidocal uh, exploration is needed, whether open or laparoscopic. So the approach is to perform ERCB before lab cholecystectomy. If it's successful to remove the stone, it's okay, followed by laparoscopic cholecystectomy. If it is not accessible, not accessible or failed, the pediatric surgeon will know that the baby will need common bile duct exploration during surgery and may need also open with or open or laparoscopic. To summarize what we said. Number one, pediatric gallbladder disease, maybe gallstone, cholelysis, maybe biliary dyskinesia, poor gallbladder contraction, dysmotility of the gallbladder, poor gallbladder ejection fraction, maybe a calcular or a calculus gallbladder disease, means disease of the gallbladder without stone. In gallstone, you should know the presentation may be asymptomatic, symptomatic, maybe complication. And also you should know the condition associated with a calcular gallbladder disease, gallbladder hydrops, a calcular cholecystitis, and gallbladder polyps. This is the condition, and you should know the biliary dyskinesia. Let's start with the a calcular gallbladder disease, gallbladder hydrops. Acute gallbladder distension and edema, no gallbladder infection or congenital anomalies, sepsis or shock or some certain diseases, and the treatment usually conservative. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy indicated if there is progress of symptoms, increasing gallbladder distension on ultrasound or gangrenous, evidence of gangrenous ultrasound. A calculus cholecystitis usually seen in critically ill patient and usually treated with intravenous antibiotics and fluids. Cholecystectomy may be indicated based on the condition of the child and we may need to perform drainage of this distended gallbladder with what's called cholecystostomy tube. Biliary dyskinesia, poor gallbladder contraction with ejection fraction less than 35. Hide the scan is diagnostic. It will assess the cystic duct and assess the contractility with an injection of analog of cholecystokinine infusion. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy may result in improvement of the symptoms. However, the result is not uniform. The family of the child should be informed about this. And the symptoms of the child may not completely resolve it after surgery. Gallbladder polyp is a rare condition in children, however, and there is no long time follow-up for these children. However, it's recommended that if there is symptomatic polyp or polyp more than one centi to be removed with laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And this also diagram uh, illustrates the management of the polyploid lesion of the gallbladder in children, maybe symptomatic, consider laparoscopic cholecystectomy asymptomatic, whether larger than one centi or smaller. If there is a high risk features, the like solitary lesion, rapid growth or associated with gallstones, no or yes. If there is yes, also consider laparoscopic cholecystectomy if there is no serial ultrasound every 6 to 12 months. Gallstones, the major corner. Presentation of the pediatric gallstones or cholelysis may be abdominal pain in the right upper quadrant or may be asymptomatic, diagnosed incidentally on doing ultrasound. The presentation may be with positive Murphy sign, colic, nausea, vomiting, actors. And in such cases, you need to perform diagnostic tests to rule out complications. You should perform blood values, CRP, leukocytosis, transaminase, and bilirubin to exclude 
the presence of the acute cholecystitis, the presence of cholangitis, the presence of CBD stone by ultrasound proof of the stone or mud stone present in the CBD or there's evidence of pancreatitis with elevated enzymes, you may need to perform CT and MRI only in some exceptional cases which is not used in children. Further diagnostic concerning the risk factors as metabolic disorder, you should search for certain causes or certain enzymatic defects for intrahepatic cholestasis. So, when you see a child with abdominal pain in the right upper quadrant and with positive Murphy signs, colic, nausea, vomiting, maybe ectras, you should suspect biliary disease, biliary stone disease, and you will perform lab, ultrasound, CT, MRI, MRCB, further diagnostic investigation, you should search for causes or chronic liver diseases associated with intrahepatic cholestasis. After that, you diagnose the case. This may be the rule for the pediatrician. After that, you will diagnose the case as a gallstone, and then you should refer the child for pediatric surgeon. What pediatric surgeon will do in the next slide. The treatment of the pediatric gallstones. We classify the presentation into symptomatic, complicated, and asymptomatic. In symptomatic, what to do with a symptomatic gallstone in a child? Elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy. However, don't forget the exception. The exception with a red color, infant less than three years, infant on pro prolonged TBN due to spontaneous resolutions of the more than 50% of the stone. Also, infant less than three years, the treatment should be individualized. Uh, the non hemolytic and the non calcified stones. Also, some pediatric surgeon will observe this. On the other extreme or the other arm, asymptomatic, the children with gold stone. The treatment, we said, as per etiology, what's the cause for this stone? Is it hemolytic or non-hemolytic? You can decide. Number two, observation. Your regular ultrasound follow-up. Trial of therapy with your sodioxycholic acid, as it will dissolve this stone if this cholesterol is stone only. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy, three school. Indicated only, indicated in all cases, not indicated. Indicated only, if there is associated comorbidity, particularly the hemolytic anemia. So asymptomatic with hemolytic the, uh, anemia or hemolytic cause, remove the gallbladder. Second, the school indicated in all cases, or, or asymptomatic. Suppose that there is a high rate of the complication. Complication may be the first presentation. Operation is more easy in asymptomatic patient. And also gallbladder cancer, and also family distress. All this will lead the pediatric surgeon to remove the gallbladder even in asymptomatic. This is school. Some pediatric surgeon believe this. And the third one, not indicated at all. There is no need to perform unnecessary cholecystectomy in asymptomatic child. So there is no need to perform this surgery as the long-term course for these children is not well known. And there is a large Grandian studies of the asymptomatic patient demonstrate that actually about 16% of the children is asymptomatic resolved and 34 of the infant resolved and the complication rate reported in this larger study less than 5%. So they suppose the conservative. And the middle column is the important one. Complicated gallstones. Pediatric surgeon face the child with complicated gallstone. Acute cholecystitis. Acute obstruction of the cystic duct with acute distension of the gallbladder usually laparoscopic cholecystectomy within 24 hours. However, you should be, uh, pay a careful evaluation of the antibiotic therapy for this type of the children. If there is cholangitis, CBD stone, cholidocholysis, or biliary pancreatitis, if there is available ERCB and spabulotomy, if the stone in the CBD within 24 hours, in a case of cholangitis, you can extract the stone and then you can or you can perform a conservative antibiotics if there is infections, cholangitis, antispasmodic analgesic IV fluid management after removing this, and then laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Some pediatric surgery more recommend to wait for about six weeks and at the end of the inflammation, preoperative exclusion of the inflammation and increased bilirubin and transaminases. This is a debatable one. How to treat a complicated to perform early cholecystectomy or delay for about six weeks. However, you should follow up and control the infection and the progress and <clears throat> check the barometer and confirm that the child is improving. 
This is how to treat the pediatric gallstones or cholelysiasis. So it's very important to understand the both arms of the symptomatic, uh, symptomatic and the elective labcoli with the exclusions or the exceptions. And these, the treatment of asymptomatics and the indication of laparoscopic and the treatment of the complicated cases. <clears throat> this is also a diagram illustrating the treatment of the known or suspected uh, cholidoco lysis, uh, which is uh, present of the CBD stone. ERCB to perform ERCB, no stones, okay, go for lap coli, confirm the stone. If the stone cleared and the ERCB is successful in removing the stone, okay, go for lap coli. If the stone is not cleared, you should perform uh, laparoscopic or open CBD exploration. Very essential diagram uh, you should put in mind when dealing with a child with coli do coli sciences. In conclusion, the gallbladder disease in children continue to increase in frequency and the number of cholecystectomies performed in children is increasing all over the world. Pediatric surgeons should feel comfortable with the diagnosis and the management of this condition. The management decision depends on the age of the child, presence of the symptoms, underlying disease and also associated comorbidities. Significant information can be learned from the present adult literature or experience, and there is increasing literature in the children. However, the experience of the pediatric surgeon in this disease is still limited. Continued evaluation and research into the changing trend in the pediatric gallbladder disease will lead to improved outcome. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think it's a very important topic for all pediatric surgeon and pediatrician to know what is gallbladder disease. Disease of the gallbladder may be related to the presence of the gallstone, cholelysis, may be related to the biliary dyskinesia, ineffective gallbladder contraction, may be related to the acalculus presentation. In case you speak about the gallstone or cholelysis, you should consider the physiology of the bile. Bile produced by the liver stored in the gallbladder, concentrated in the gallbladder, then ejaculated into the biliary system, into the intestine when you eat a fatty food. This bile contains bile acids, bile salt, cholesterol, water and electrolyte, and also excrete waste product of destruction of the RBCs. There is a ratio between the cholesterol, bile acid, and the bile salt. If this ratio is unbalanced, the cholesterol will precipitate. How the cholesterol is passed in bile? The cholesterol will pass surrounded by the bile acid and the bile salt, forming what's called mixed micelle. There is a four gates in the biliary canalicular membrane. This gate is responsible for release of the phospholipid, one for phospholipid, and one for the cholesterol, and one for bile acids. If there is genetic defect here, the phospholipid will decrease and will not pass and, the phos and there will be what's called low phospholipid cholestasis. There is a stasis. Uh, this condition is known in adults as well as in the children. Then the questions will give rise to what about the risk factors for the development of the gallstones in a child or neonate. There is maybe hemolysis or hemolytic cholelic decisis or gallstones increased destruction of the RBCs, increased production of unconjugated bilirubin. This unconjugated bilirubin insoluble. This unconjugated bilirubin will precipitate in the bile, combined with calcium forming what's called calcium bilirubinate or black stone. Also, there is maybe non-hemolytic variety of the causes, maybe genetic as we said, maybe biliary stasis and TBN, stasis of the gallbladder, more absorption of the water from the bile, more concentration, biliary sedimentation, high cholesterol intake in the obese, or high production of the cholesterol, less productions of the phospholipids, liver disease or intrahepatic cholestasis or cholestatic disease associated with biliary, formation, uh, biliary stone formation, gallbladder. Maybe children undergoing resection of the terminal ileum. In Crohn's ulcerative colitis, please try to preserve the terminal ileum and EU sickle valve if it can be possible. Due to <coughs> reabsorption of the bile salt and bile acid, the liver produces a bile salt and bile acid about 5%. 95 will be reabsorbed again to the liver. So don't remove this part of the bowel. 
to avoid decreasing the bile salt pool and increase cholesterol precipitation of the stones. Maybe contraceptive, maybe use in the adolescent, maybe pregnancy, all of these conditions will be associated with slow gallbladder and precipitation of the sediment stasis of the gallbladder or stasis of the bile in the gallbladder. Then you should know uh, the types of the gallstones, maybe cholesterol, maybe pigment stone, maybe calcium carbonate, and maybe something called microlis, small gallbladder stone, less than three millimeter. And you should remember the associated one is called inspissated uh, pill, bile, or what's called pillary mud or a sludge. This pillary mud is very common to be precipitation of the cholesterol and the calcium associated with pillary mucin and forming what's but mud or sludge within the biliary tree intra or extra hepatic commonly in the children with uh, infections stomach infection and biliary stasis and something like this uh, after that you should know how to think about the diagnosis of clinical presentation with a clinical presentation biliary colic classic one referred to the shoulder after 30 mil lasting for a few hours or asymptomatic presentation in small or young children may present with just nausea vomiting, not a classic pain. You may need to perform ultrasounds, it's the gold standard and the first investigation. Hydra scan is performed in certain conditions when you suspect acute cholecystitis or biliary dyskinesia. And you may need to MRCB. What's biliary dyskinesia? This is the second one of the gallbladder disease. It's inadequate or poor gallbladder contraction with. Uh, ejection fraction, gallbladder ejection fraction less than 35. It's diagnosed in children who have the symptoms of the biliary colic but without evidence of the gallstones. And the third one is acalcular or acalculus gallbladder problems related to the high drops of the gallbladder acalcular cholecystitis or gallbladder polyp. And finally, we'll go to the management how to treat gallstones in children very important how to treat the treatment will depend on the age you deal with a new need infant or child the treatment will depend on the type of the stone you deal with pigment stone due to hemolysis cholesterol stone or you deal with what calcium carbonate or microlis or biliary uh, mud or in specific bile this is a cause underlying cause what's the etiology what's the risk factors this child then we will classify in the units the incidence of the gallstones is about less than 0.5 and may happen without any risk factors. How to treat most school recommend observation and conservative therapy due to high incidence of spontaneous resolution. Lab cholecystectomy only if there is infection or symptoms. This is number one. Number two, the group children. Children we may have asymptomatic, symptomatic or complicated. In asymptomatic in asymptomatic children, there is a debate. The published treatment is observation, treatment per etiology, you should search for the etiology, and number two, trial to dissolve this stone with uh, oral dissolution therapy or to the oxycholic acid. And also perform, luckily or not, this is a large debate in asymptomatic patients. One is cool, only recommend the lab cholecystectomy in case with associated comorbidities like hemolysis. So the cause will be hemolytic anemia, so remove the gallbladder. Second school said that remove in all cases, the high sense of complication, operation easy in asymptomatic trial, gallbladder chance for getting cancer and also psychological distress for the family. As this is regarding asymptomatic. Regarding symptomatic children, the logic is to remove the gallbladder elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy. However, there is also exception. In infant less than three years, you should individualize case by case. Number two, infant on prolonged TBN, as more than half will resolve spontaneously if you follow up the child from six to 12 months. Number three, some pediatric surgeon at non-hemolytic, non-calcified stone to be followed. This is the symptom. And then we go to the treatment of the complication, acute cholecystitis, cholangitis, and uh, cholidocholecystitis or uh, CBD stone and uh, biliary pancreatitis.
It's very important to do that the CBD stone is managed in adult very easy with RCV. The problem in children is team is not usually available in all centers and the delicate infant or small child may be difficult to perform in RCV and may need help. The diagnosis with this presentation of the gallstones may be related to the symptom or asymptoms and usually diagnosed by the pediatrician who refer the case to the pediatric surgeon who will take the treatment decision. I hope the topic is beneficial for all pediatric surgeon and pediatrician dealing with the children. It's very important for all pediatric surgeon to be familiar with the indication for lab cholecystic to be in symptomatic and asymptomatic and also in complicated children. Also, it's very important for the pediatrician to know how to, what's the presentation, how to diagnose and how to treat. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope the topic is very efficient and uh, very beneficial for all of you. And see you next in next subject of pediatric surgery made easy. Thank you very much.